The task of taking apart the Mekron ship, a colossal undertaking for us, was something out of a science fiction story. To the Mekrons, an advanced mechanical civilization from the stars, their ship was merely a scout vessel. Earth had grand designs for the alien ship, but first, we needed to peel back its layers, study its secrets, and understand its technology. Humanity was eager to align this ship with our cause, just like we did with the portal, leaving no stone unturned in our quest to unlock its mysteries. Despite its daunting size, people came together, inspired not by governments, which were gradually fading into history, but by the powerful corporations that stepped up to lead. While relying solely on these corporations was a gamble, the allure of alien technology, even just scraps of alien metal, promised enormous financial returns. Ambitious ventures like the Megacity Projects, envisioned as self-sustaining spacefaring habitats, showcased our unchanging nature. Even faced with the threat of extinction, our fascination with wealth remained undiminished. This was the moment for Salvage Inc. to shine, a scrappy startup that gambled on a dream, sinking funds they didn't really have into a short-term lease for a slice of the Mekron ship. They were driven by the hope of striking it rich in the great tech rush, financed by a loan from Bill Enterprises. Bill, a somewhat familiar face in their circle, had made his fortune by selling knockoffs, mastering the art of reverse engineering anything he could find to produce more affordable alternatives. Despite some dubious connections best left unexplored, their venture pressed on. The crew managed to get their hands on a humble spacecraft, aptly named the Surplus Runner. Considering the necessity to ferry all their discoveries from Earth to a significant shipyard in orbit around Jupiter, Securing such a vessel became a critical part of their plan. Amidst swirling rumors, there was talk of Earth commissioning its own dreadnought, a titanic warship to match the Mekron's might, just in case the alien vessel proved uncontrollable. The strategy was clear. If the ship threatened to awaken on Earth, it would be safer to confront it in the vastness of space, where, as a last resort, it could be destroyed without risking the planet. With a 300-year window before the Mekron's expected return, time seemed to be on humanity's side. Time aplenty, Nicordis Bortson would say, chuckling. As Salvage Inc.'s sole engineer and a firm believer in a shoot first, ask questions, never approach, Nicordis was as unique as they come, blending a rare mix of ingenuity and bravado. Vecca Rin stood at the helm of Salvage Inc., her venture into the unknown driven by both desperation and determination. Her striking beauty and presence belied the heavy burden of debt she carried, a debt so monumental that not even a fire sale of her internal organs would dent it. Fortunately, her skills extended beyond leadership. Enter Falir Synchrone, the newest addition to the team, whose employment seemed as serendipitous as it was impromptu. Over casual beers, what began as idle chatter quickly turned into a job offer, cementing his place in the fledgling company. Nicordus, with a hint of jest in his voice, raised an eyebrow at their newest team member. Did we really need to bring Falaire on board? I was under the impression we were keeping this a tight two-person gig. Vecca, caught between explanation and amusement, gave a small, unsure shrug, her voice tinged with the buzz of their recent beer-fueled decision-making. You know, it kind of just... happened. After a few rounds, it seemed like a great idea. He's actually a perfect fit for what we need. She ended with a nervous chuckle, trying to dispel the tension with her laughter. Nicordus couldn't resist a playful jab, though his smile didn't quite hide his skepticism. I don't know, Vecca, he said, glancing over at Falaire, who was a safe distance away, oblivious to their scrutiny. He's got that look, you know, like he could sell sand in the desert. His smile broadened, a silent acknowledgement of the unpredictable, sometimes haphazard nature of their teamwork. The dynamic among the crew was as eclectic as their backgrounds. Nicordus's amusement turned to dismay as he observed Falaire's unconventional attempt at mechanical repairs, signaling a potential mismatch of skills. Then the moment of truth arrived with a flick of a switch, Vecca initiating the startup sequence of their ship, only to be greeted by Biscuit, their bargain AI from Gurgle. Biscuit's brief and colorful swearing followed by a processor malfunction was a stark reminder of the challenges ahead. The path for this trio, formed under less than auspicious circumstances, was fraught with uncertainty. Yet, amidst the chaos and the comical dysfunction, they were ready to face the vast unknown. In the gritty reality of space salvage, Nicordus and Falaire, well, mostly Nicordus, 
were entrenched in the challenge of getting their less-than-reliable spacecraft, the Bill Enterprise's surplus runner, operational. This ship, a bargain acquisition fraught with as many issues as a long-term crack habit, was their ticket to potential fortune. Vecca, ever the optimist, had gambled heavily on this venture, betting not just their futures but also, quite literally, a piece of herself. Two kidneys, to be precise. As I subtly hint at the unfolding drama, it's clear that optimism alone might not steer them clear of the looming troubles. Despite the odds, and with minimal assistance from Falir, they managed to coax the knockoff spaceship into a semblance of functionality, managing a brief sortie into orbit and back, albeit not without its share of hiccups. Docked within the cavernous expanse of the Mekron vessel, their allocated section awaited, a vast warehouse of metal crates and boxes that promised both treasure and toil. The mandate was clear. Catalog everything. Segregate the hazardous. Adhere to the stringent protocols. The salvage operation was vast, and with the stakes so high, the risk of losing their salvage license loomed large, especially for Vecca, whose already precarious financial gamble was further complicated by the literal stake of her organs. Tasked with what seemed an insurmountable job for their small team, Correction duo, Vecca's hopes hinged on a swift, lucrative find. With her connections to Bill Enterprises, she entertained visions of striking it rich and retiring to the luxurious Entech megacity in Europe. A dream of escape from the perilous edge they were walking, to a future of ease and opulence. Yet, as they delved into the depths of their galactic endeavor, the harsh realities of space salvage threatened to eclipse the dreams that fueled their journey. Three weeks into their venture, Vecca, Nicordus, and Faleri had made only a tiny dent in the vastness of the Mekron ship's cargo hold, cataloging a mere 0.7% of its contents. Amidst the vast sea of debris, broken gadgets, and alien artifacts of indiscernible purpose, the hunt for anything of value, let alone weapons, proved fruitless. Their discoveries, so far, amounted to nothing more than a collection of enigmatic objects, many of which might as well have been locked to alien users' DNA, if they were of any use at all. Vecca, peering around at the cluttered confines of the hangar bay, couldn't help but let out a bemused sigh. It's gotta be, she mused aloud, the corners of her lips twitching upwards. The Mechrons must be distant cousins of hamsters. Why else would they hoard all these bits and bobs in such a random place? Nicordus, leaning against a nearby console, cast a thoughtful glance over the scattered technology. You know, he started, adopting the tone of someone about to divulge a well-kept secret. I came across a wild theory that they don't actually come up with any of their tech on their own. They scavenge, find what works, and then fold it into their own designs. Imagine that, letting your adversaries do all the hard work, only to swoop in and claim the fruits of their labor. Vecca's response was immediate her voice laced with a mix of amusement and incredulity. Space hamsters, she declared, an assertive nod accompanying her newfound term for their intergalactic adversaries. Our planet got a taste of cosmic rodents. Biscuit's sudden beep over the intercom made Vecca jump, her nerves already frayed over the thought of losing her kidneys. The AI's reminder that they had only a week left to uncover something valuable added to her stress, urging them to hurry up. Nicordus, ever laid back, seemed unfazed, joking again about having time o' plenty. He was blissfully unaware of the gravity of their situation, not fully grasping the precarious position Vecca had put them in. Falere, on the other hand, was there primarily to oversee their investment, making sure they didn't attempt to dodge their financial obligations. Vecca's frustration reached a peak when she kicked a small box, causing it to spill its contents across the cold metal floor. Among the scattered items, a device started to hum to life. Vecca, driven by a mix of desperation and hope, quickly picked it up. Her eyes lit up with the possibility of their find as the others gathered around to see. At that moment, Biscuit, in her typical rude manner, beeped again, announcing the detection of an unfamiliar type of matter particle. The startle from Biscuit's alert caused Vecca to drop the device, its indicator lights ominously transitioning from green to red. Falir, chimed in with a deadpan delivery that only he could manage. I think red means bad, he stated, his tone dry enough to suggest he might be on the brink of discovering fire. The simplicity of his observation, 
in stark contrast to the tension of the moment, couldn't help but draw a brief, incredulous laugh from the others. Before any further speculation or jest could be made, a sudden whoosh enveloped them, a sound marking the beginning of an unforeseen event. In an instant, Biscuit's audience vanished, leaving the AI to voice its growing irritation into the void. The trio, through a twist of fate catalyzed by their latest find, found themselves propelled into an unknown situation, their whereabouts a mystery. Biscuit, with her digital voice echoing slightly in the suddenly quiet space. Hello? Anyone? Then the AI went on a rant that would make a sailor blush, before overheating its processor yet again, shutting down. Transported by the mysterious device's activation, Vecca, Nicordus, and Falaire found themselves unceremoniously deposited into a setting far removed from the confines of the Mecron vessel they had been scouring. The darkness enveloped them, a stark contrast to the clinical, albeit cluttered, environment they had left behind. The stale air and decrepit surroundings hinted at a place long forgotten, with only the faintest light providing any sense of direction. Falaire's voice broke through the darkness, tinged with annoyance and disbelief. Who turned the fucking lights off? It was a shout that seemed to bounce off the walls, filled with the kind of exasperation one might reserve for a sudden, unwelcome plunge into darkness. Nicordus, with a calmer expression, responded with a hint of dry humor in his voice. I don't think this is the Mecron ship, guys. The sudden activation of emergency lighting revealed a grim scene. Vecca's voice was a whisper of disbelief, barely audible over the eerie silence that enveloped them. Definitely not where we used to be, for sure, she stated, her eyes wide as they took in the grim tableau before them. The shock of finding themselves amidst a sprawling graveyard of human corpses within the confines of a ship, a metal tomb floating in the void of space, was palpable. The way she stood, still, almost holding her breath, spoke volumes of the unexpected and possibly unsettling sight before her, highlighting the stark contrast between this place and anywhere they had been before. Her hand reached out, almost involuntarily, to knock against the cold, unyielding metal of the hull, a hollow sound echoing back as if to confirm their grim reality. We're definitely still inside a ship, she said, her voice steadier now, but laced with a haunting realization. Nicordus, ever observant, joined in, his gaze shifting beyond the immediate horror to the vista outside. In space, there's a planet down there, but that's not Earth, guys. His addition painted a fuller picture of their predicament, marooned on a vessel of terrestrial origin, but adrift in an alien star system, surrounded by the remnants of a tragedy. The pressing question of their whereabouts was soon overshadowed by more immediate concerns, the circumstances leading to the ship's fate and whether the architects of its demise were still lurking nearby. The discovery of the ship's name, Requiem, were scattered across items and uniforms amidst the desolation. They noticed that all the fallen crew members had the same device as theirs, on their belt, Vecca's realization that these devices, identical to the one that had spirited them away, were meant for emergency teleportation back to the ship. The very fact that their own device had transported them to this forsaken vessel raised more questions than answers. Was their arrival a mere fluke of cosmic proportions, or had they been deliberately chosen to bear witness to this grim tableau? The mystery of the device's origin and its presence among the Mechron salvage deepened the enigma. With the ship's emergency power still humming in the background, a testament to its lingering will to survive, the trio pressed on toward the bridge, driven by a mix of dread and determination. Vecca's fleeting glimpses of movement in the periphery of her vision stoked the embers of fear and wonder alike. Her voice carried a mix of jest and unease as she broke the silence. I think we aren't alone, guys. Nicordus, quick to play along, matched her tone with a wry smile. It's a good thing we aren't armed then, he quipped back, the humor in his voice tinged with sarcasm. Maybe it was just a false alarm. His words, though spoken in jest, carried the unspoken hope that their fears were unfounded. As they navigated through the corridors of the Requiem, its design evoked a sense of nostalgia and alienness, marrying the familiar aesthetics of televised science fiction with the stark reality of their situation. Then, as if summoned by their very presence, a voice cut through the silence, anchoring them to the moment. It was the Requiem's automated warning system alerting them to the impending descent into the planet's atmosphere. Nicordus, 
ever the optimist in the face of impending doom, couldn't help but find a silver lining, even as their situation teetered on the edge of dire. Well, that's not good, he started, his voice laced with an unmistakable hint of irony. But still, we have three hours. That's time, oh, plenty to see if we can get this ship flying again. The treacherous journey to the bridge, hampered by the ship's dilapidated state and the eerie silence punctuated by intermittent power failures, did little to prepare them for the sight that awaited. The bridge, a command center frozen in time and tragedy, was populated by the remains of the crew, mutated beyond recognition, yet mercifully inert, posing no threat. The lack of security measures on the terminals, while fortunate, underscored the gravity of the Requiem's final hours, as the crew had likely abandoned protocol in a desperate bid for survival. Commander Atlas Vale's greeting from the archives introducing them to the Requiem as a military vessel of the NTech Earth Defense Force presented a conundrum that challenged their understanding of their own world. The notion that the Requiem, and by extension, the NDF, was an entity outside their historical and dimensional knowledge suggested that they had stumbled upon a fragment of an alternate reality where NTech, or NTech as it vaguely resonated with Vecca, had evolved differently. The corrupted logs hinted at a narrative filled with gaps, yet they pieced together enough to ascertain that the Requiem had been adrift for an unfathomable duration, its mission and ultimate downfall lost to the void. The deliberate erasure of the AI system hinted at a catastrophic failure or a final desperate measure taken by the crew. As Vecca and Falaire delved deeper into the ship's logs, their search for operational systems and any clue to the Requiem's mission and fate became a race against time. The possibility that this ship was from another dimension or era entirely opened up as many questions as it did avenues for escape. With the ship's descent marking a finite timeline for their survival, the urgency to unearth the Requiem's secrets and find a means to avert their fiery end grew increasingly dire. Nicordus had a knack for drifting away, often led by curiosity without a moment's notice. This time, his wandering gaze found a beacon in the dim, an engineering terminal that seemed to whisper promises of untold stories. As he coaxed the console to life, revealing schematics that danced with possibilities, he discovered the heart of the vessel, a Tryon drive. The realization that they were aboard a ship that dwarfed Earth's technological achievements with its advanced capabilities, plasma shields, dark matter weapons, and long-distance quantum teleportation was staggering. It was as if the boundaries of their reality had expanded, embracing the realm of science fiction. The ship, despite its size, appeared almost modest next to the gargantuan Mechron vessel, yet what it contained within its metal skeleton was nothing short of extraordinary. The power it promised to wield was akin to harnessing the fury of a small star. With a few deft touches, Nicordus awakened the Tryon Drive its hum a signal of life coursing through the ship's veins. As lights flickered on and the canopy retracted to reveal the scars of space travel, asteroid impacts that told tales of narrow escapes and silent battles, the ship stood defiant, battered yet unbroken, ready to carve its path through the stars once more. The realization that they had stumbled upon technology far surpassing anything known to current Earth standards ignited a spark of hope and ambition within the trio particularly for Vecca, as she quipped, Well, if this isn't great salvage, I don't know what else is, seeing in the Requiem not just a means of survival, but a potential treasure trove that could redefine humanity's place in the cosmos. Falaria's question, laced with a mix of hope and weariness, broke the tension. Well, it's nice, so when can we go home? Nicordus, teetering on the edge of a response, found himself momentarily caught in the gravity of the situation. His thoughts raced, crafting the perfect retort. But before the words could take flight, the ship's computer coldly cut in, T-minus 60 minutes before total loss of vessel. The sterile announcement hung between them like a guillotine's blade. Vecca, quick to grasp the urgency, shot Nicordus a look that mixed encouragement with a dash of sarcasm. You might want to get on that, Nicordus, or we'll be experiencing the atmosphere's temperature challenge up close and personal, she quipped a nervous chuckle barely veiling the seriousness of their predicament. Backwards, given how we're angled, she added. Falaire, ever the optimist, or perhaps just clinging to a shred of denial, shrugged off the dire warnings with a cavalier remark. How hard can it be, right? Press some knobs, pull some levers, easy. 
It's fortunate that Nicordus has such a laid-back personality. Otherwise, if we suddenly found ourselves in need of someone to test the airlock, I think it's pretty clear who'd be first in line for that risky job. And no, he wouldn't even be getting a spacesuit for the ordeal. Their focus was razor-sharp as they navigated the complexities of the ship's controls, a task made all the more pressing by the ship's computer, which solemnly counted down the time they had left. T-minus ten minutes. Just when the situation seemed most dire, Nicordus, with a mixture of hope and determination, announced he had cracked the console. Got it, he said, a confident smile in his voice. This is how it works, guys. Pretty damn sure about it. And with that, he initiated the thrusters, unwittingly setting them on a backward trajectory towards the planet. The computer's voice, calm and unchanging, marked T-5 seconds, ramping up the tension. Vecca's reaction was immediate and unfiltered, her gaze sharp enough to rival the edge of a knife, silently screaming, What the heck, dude? as the realization hit them that they were, quite literally, going the wrong way. How should I know this was reverse? Nicordus exclaimed, his voice a blend of surprise and frustration, as he hurriedly corrected their course, shifting into forward gear. The ship, groaning under the stress of sudden movement, began to shudder as if shaking off years of inertia, narrowly escaping the planet's gravitational embrace. The crew's relief at averting disaster was short-lived, as they faced the daunting task of assessing the Requiem's extensive damages. The realization that they were now adrift in an unknown system, with a barely operational ship that boasted technology far beyond their understanding, set the stage for their next challenge. As they meticulously navigated through the ship's battered corridors, the team took stock of the damages, prioritizing repairs that needed to be addressed before they could even think about pushing the limits of their newfound propulsion system. The Trion Drive, a piece of technology that seemed to flirt with the edges of the Triverse theory, a concept that, until their adventure, had not been fully understood or confirmed, promised capabilities far beyond traditional FTL drives. But understanding exactly how it functioned remained a mystery for another time. Their immediate concern was coaxing it into working well enough to guide them home. Their exploration led them to a revelation, one that sparked more questions than answers. Tucked away within the ship was a portal device, seamlessly integrated into the ship's framework, a stark contrast to the makeshift device they had encountered on the Mechron ship. This discovery begged the question, if the Mechrons possessed technology capable of instantaneously bridging the vast expanses of space, why did they rely on slower, more conventional means of travel? Upon closer inspection, they found that the portal was cocooned within multiple force fields, a safeguard perhaps activated by the Tryon Drive's reawakening. How the ship managed to sustain such a drain without a conventional power source was yet another riddle. It seemed to draw power from the portal itself, a symbiosis of energy and matter that defied their current understanding of physics. Three months flew by, each day melding into the next, as they poured their efforts into making the ship their own. Despite humanity's aspirations for peace, their primal instinct for survival kicked in first. The trio made sure to arm themselves, scavenging the ship for any working weapons and armor. Gradually, through their tireless work, the ship began to resemble something that could be called home. But back on the bridge, the Tryon Drive's efficiency, or corruption, as the display dubiously indicated, hovered at 64%, a figure they hoped was a quirk in the system, rather than an accurate measure of its reliability. Shields hummed back to life. Yet, for all their progress, their exact position in the cosmos remained a mystery, a question mark that lingered over their heads like an uncharted constellation. The ship's logs, when pieced back together, unveiled a harrowing story of its previous occupants, a narrative stained with tragedy. Commander Vale, having escaped his ship on one of its shuttles, emerged as the sole survivor of an ordeal that turned his crew into nothing short of nightmares, victims of a virulent outbreak that ravaged flesh and mind alike. The entries hinted at experimentation with biotechnology. Ambitious, perhaps reckless, and ultimately catastrophic. Yet, amid the shadows of the past, the crew of Salvage Inc. saw glimmers of hope. They understood the ship's potential and its dangers, recognizing the fine line between discovery and disaster. As they moved forward, the weight of the ship's history rested on their shoulders. Drifting off course in their conversations, they mused over the possibility of the Mechron having been on the ship. 
The thought alone was unsettling, yet they found solace in the evidence, or lack thereof. If the mechanical invaders had boarded, their presence would have been undeniable, marked by chaos and destruction. But the ship was silent, save for the ghosts of its past. No Mechron marauders, no lingering threats, not even the whisper of a virus. It was a relief, though the sealed and abandoned sections of the ship whispered tales of caution, reminding them of dangers unknown and unseen. In a moment of boldness or perhaps whimsy, they decided it was time to test the capabilities of the try and drive. Vecca, with a spark of excitement in her eyes, eased into the captain's chair. There was a gravity to her actions, a childhood dream unfolding as she uttered the command she'd always imagined saying, Engage. The anticipation was palpable as the ship hummed to life, a portal swirling into existence before them, a doorway to the stars, to possibilities. But as they began their tentative journey through the portal, the ship's computer, ever the harbinger of unwelcome news, blared out a stark warning. Error. Portal safety systems offline. Followed by an even more unsettling alert. Warning. Non-human life form. On board. Detected. The realization that they were not alone, that something or someone else was with them, transforming their moment of triumph into the onset of a new, unforeseen challenge. But that Triverse story will have to be told another day. If you've stuck with me up to this point, a heartfelt thank you. I'd also like to take a moment to remind you that my entire channel is dedicated to the Triverse and its enthralling Mechron Mechanoid saga. While many of the stories stand alone, allowing you to dive in at any point, crafting these narratives takes about four or five days each, so your patience is greatly appreciated. If you find yourself enjoying what you see, consider exploring more of my videos. Each one, in its own unique way, weaves together more of the overarching story I'm telling.